that uh, is Mr. Fesu Skeyamo, a legal practitioner. He, he tried to go into politics. Maybe I should even ask. <laughs> <laughs> Don't start without this one. <laughs> Thank you for coming on this morning, by the way. Thank you so much. For okay, uh, let's uh, start off with this. Uh, because we, we see this time and again. Uh, police have suspects. They invite journalists and say, look, this is what we have. And then they go on talking about it. That's some, some PROs they do there, particularly that one in Benway. But looking at all of those, I mean, here, uh, our judicial system says a man is innocent until proven guilty. So parading those suspects, what does that mean in law? Well, I think it's a breach of their constitutional rights. Um, let us put it as simply uh, as that. In fact, there are two particular sections of the 1909 Constitution that um, that particular action um, breaches. Uh, one is Section 34 that talks about um, subjecting people to inhuman and degrading treatment. That is inhuman and degrading treatment. When you parade a person on national television and virtually inform the whole world that the person is guilty of the offense that he is alleged to have committed, uh, if you listen um, to the report that you just played on television, um, the, is it the CP or the PRO was actually reading the statements, so-called confessional statements allegedly made by those suspects. He did not just parade them as having been arrested in connection with certain crimes, which, of course, to be, to be honest, happens all over the world. Even in America, that is more or less like the benchmark for us, we see people at times arrested and they are shown on national television that have been arrested in connection with certain crimes that have been committed. But then here, as a bit different, we do it in a way that suggests that they are guilty of such offenses. For example, the difference I've just shown now is that that policeman was actually reading the statements of that suspect to the world, that he's confessed that they went here, they killed this person, the person now confessed that they went. Those confessional statements will eventually be subject to judicial scrutiny, even before they are admitted in evidence. And by so reading them on national television, by, you know, because if you tell a lie 10,000 times, it almost becomes the truth. So you are actually biasing the mind of those who eventually will look at that case. When the world as a whole would virtually believe that those persons or that particular person has committed that offense. But does it really so, matter? Sorry, I wanted you to key this in. Since we don't have a jury system in Nigeria, does it really matter? No, the judge also makes reaches a decision. Oh well, the, the the whether a jury or judge, the 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 underlining thread of you know is is that the person who is to reach a decision, his mind must be on by his or her mind must be unbiased by external reports. You must look, look at the facts of the case the way they are presented to you and not by media reports. But do those so, media reports have any bearing on how the judge reaches his decision? It may not have, it may not, they may not have um, apparent and obvious bearings, but they have subterranean bear bearings. If you, if you are part of the society, you listen to the media, you listen to news, you cannot rule it out. I mean, at this level, we cannot say the media is unimportant. You know, at times, the media pressure forces judiciary to a particular angle at times. And that's what they call public policy at times. When the, when the entire world and the entire country, you know, is thinking in a particular direction, at times, the judiciary is always very, very reluctant to go to the other direction. They want to satisfy public um, expectations. No, but looking at it, I think that in our society, though, we sometimes demand those things. For instance, it would seem that the police have been pressured into doing, into undertaking these kind of ventures because society is demanding results. Uh, you, you say you catch criminals. Where are the criminals? And in, in some cases, it would seem that these are also lifesavers for these people because there you get to find people saying, no, I didn't do this thing, or no, I was just packed along as a part of this, and then that sometimes also help people who have been declared or who have finally found themselves to be innocent. Well, well, what you are witnessing is mob mentality. Because, you know, when you're saying people are demanding, people are demanding, it's mob, it's mob mentality. We want to see what you have done. We want to see the, the person who killed that child or that committed that offense that everybody's been talking about. Mm -hmm. We want to see. It's mob mentality. And I'm sorry, no matter how much the public expects the police to um, bring results, what they are, it doesn't make you know, uh, render right what they are doing. It doesn't make it right. Because the second section I was to, I was to mention is Section 36. Apart from the, the, you know, the, the section that talks about 
degrading and in human treatment. Section 36 talks about fair hearing. And embedded in that is that you must not do anything to foist a fait accompli on the court or to, or to create a situation where you, know, uh, you bias the mind of the court or the mind of the public. So a person must be presumed innocent until he's proven guilty. Embedded in that principle is also you know, the principle that you must not do anything to suggest the guilt of the person until the court reaches a decision on that matter. Now, this is suggestion of guilt. Parading the suspect is suggestion of guilt. Let us take this instance, because you, you've tried to compare what happens in the United States with Nigeria, and you said that it's somewhat different, because you find that people are arrested in connection with certain cases. In this particular instance, uh, these this suspects were paraded in connection with this case, you know, the son of a chief judge, the mother of the of the uh, deceased is not convinced that these are actually the people who did, you know. So in some case, in, in this case, it seems a little controversial because it would seem that there's a little more to it or one would think that there's a little more to it than meets the eye. Would you say that this particular instance meets the criteria for parading suspects? Are you absolutely saying that it not. shouldn't be done at all? A absolutely not. You see, uh, it's a different thing. There's a thin line between when you just show pictures on people, uh, for people on television to say certain persons have been arrested in connection with certain crimes and then investigations are going on to prove whether they are actually linked to the crimes or not or whether they committed the crimes or not. Now, that is even still wrong, you know, by my own judgment, even if it happens in the United States. It's still wrong. But then, here, the difference is that at times you have to even play up the the voices of those suspects. You are journalists. You go at times to those, you know, uh, um, uh, news conferences, mm -hmm. and then you now allow the journalists. At times, you don't know what whether those people have been beaten and tortured, or they have been threatened that if you don't say the truth, or they don't even they have not had access to their lawyers, so they don't know the implication of what they are saying. You know, you allow journalists go to them, and there are times they now start, they start saying that, uh, please, oh, it is hunger that pushed me to do this, so people should forgive me. Uh, I'm the one that did this. I'm the one that did that. You shouldn't play that on before they are taken to court. Because, first of all, a judge who is to determine that case at the end, they're looking at that, that suspect confessing on national television, and the suspect now comes to court at the end of the day and says, I'm not guilty. And the, and the person is rejecting the statement or saying that the statement was made under duress. The mind of the judge is already biased. He said, this is the man I saw confessing the other day on television. What is he saying in the dock now? So those statements by those accused persons should not be played on national television because those statements, those statements must be subject to judicial scrutiny at the end of the day to determine their admissibility or the weight to be attached to those statements. Now let's look at police investigations themselves because we've seen two, I mean, in this particular instance now, one of the suspects, uh, said that I don't know anything about this. I was just picked up along with, you know, these other people because they were picking people up and I happened to be there at that particular point in time. That man wasn't under any duress. Maybe he was paraded and maybe he had been forced to confess something. But when he finally saw the cameras, he maybe he thought it was his chance to finally, you know, set himself free. How thorough are police investigations or do they just rely basically on confessions? <laughs> well, it's either way, you know, it's, uh, there are two ways. It's either by confessional statements or by their investigations. Here, the problem we have here is we don't lack the personnel. We do have the personnel. But at times, they lack the resources to go the whole hog. Because at times, in order to unravel very serious crimes, you have to go a long way. It demands painstaking investigation, time, and resources at times to get to the, you know, determine them. You are even talking about um, uh, violent crimes. You know, the most complicated investigations are not even violent crimes. Because in most cases, those ones are not um, intelligent people. Most of these, you know, armed robbers and all that. The most, you know, uh, complicated investigations are financial crimes. They are financial crimes. Because people who steal, especially from the public steal, they are intelligent people. They go a long way to cover their tracks with the movement of funds across the world. I'm sure you just saw the one that they arrested them. You know, Nigerians trying to smuggle cash into South Africa. Where did that cash take off from? They arrested them at the point of entry. What about the point of takeoff? Why didn't they arrest them at the point of takeoff? <laughs> the, that, tra that, 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 those, that cash has traveled, you know, um, you know, around the continent before arriving in South Africa. I'm sure maybe from Nigeria. 
So that is how people cover their tracks. I'm just telling you how you know, financial crimes um, go. So here the problem is the lack of resources, the lack of um, training, adequate training at times. Because for those who are involved in investigating financial crimes, they must be properly trained. Properly trained. What to about understand. violent crimes? Violent crimes. We, we, we have um, the special anti-robbery squad. We have um, a special unit to, that deal with um, violent crimes in Nigeria. They are up to the task, I can tell you, because if you see at times when you touch a policeman or a law enforcement agent, you kill him or you maim him or you rob him, in one day they will get the official out. When it affects them at times, they go all the way to fish you out. At times, they are not just motivated. They need to be given money to go to every single assignment. And at times, the funds are not there. At times, they are not properly paid. At times, they are not motivated by the fact that they see people who die in active service. And so uh, they, they see the way people who die in active service are treated, I mean. And so they are not mot motivated to die you know, for the cause. Remember some, a week ago, I just cried out to the public that a policeman who, who died in service about some um, years ago, they've not paid the pension to the family, wife and five children, and they were coming to evict them from, um, from the police barracks. So where do, you inter where do you want them to go? You know, and you've not paid their pension. Yeah, where they, will use to, they can use to rent another house and maybe start a small business, and you're going to throw them out to the streets. You know, and the man died in service. Mr. Kim, if you have